Well, you know, the one thing that, that I that I want everybody to understand is we need all the agricultural people that we can possibly have. Uh, and, and the good news is some of these, these incubator farms that are starting small farmers, uh, that's a good thing. Numbers mean, numbers mean a lot. And, and the good thing is I, in agriculture, I have never seen this much opportunity before. We went through a time when if you were a, a beginning farmer or a small farmer, you know, you, you almost had no chance. But now with, with local foods and, and some of the specialty items that we have out there at CSA, there's opportunities for, for people to get into agriculture and younger people to come in. And, and, I, and that's a great thing. To do. And one of the things that I've tried to do with the uh, Local Sustainable Food Policy Council is to make sure everybody understands that we're under one tent. Uh, we're not separated. There's no separation between people that grow organics and people that grow local foods from the, from the, the largest farms that we have in the state. It's all one tent. And with the demand we have out there, there's plenty of room for everybody under this tent. And if we all are united and move forward and have a, a single voice, we're going to be fine. The state, that, boy, I'm glad you said that. That's a softball. Uh, the state fair begins October the 12th and runs through the 22nd. And I certainly do want to invite everybody to the fair. It's a wonderful educational opportunity for agriculture and uh, just a, a fun time. And, and quite frankly, when I became commissioner, that was probably the scariest part of the job. Uh, when you have this many people come visit you and there's 110 rides running and all the food and everything that can go wrong, uh, you know, it's a, it's a daunting task, but we divide it into small bits and pieces and everybody does their job and it's like a train. You get on board and hold on and just, if you don't fall off, everything's fine. So it, it, it's going to be another wonderful year. And that, that's one of the proudest things that, uh, that, that I see over the past uh, two terms is we moved that fair up to, uh, to really to national prominence with over a million people coming to visit uh, the past two years. Uh, that's quite a quite a feat, and, and my state fair division has done a wonderful job and with all the improvements we've been able to make at the fairground. It, it's, it's quite amazing, and I want everybody to also understand the state fair is receipt supporting, which means it's a business. We uh, we don't get a state appropriation for it, so everything we do out there has got to be done through a business mode. So. Uh, we uh, we try to make money and try to spend it very carefully and save money and uh, so far everything has gone fine. But the state fair is just like farming; it's weather dependent. Uh, the last two years I have been so blessed. We've had uh, each year we had one piece of a day that we had some uh, you know light rain or, or something. But you know I just cross my fingers that I don't get one of those weeks where it rains every day. Uh, and that of course that would be very detrimental. But we do uh, keep some in the rainy day fund, so that if that happens, we, uh, we've got money to move forward with. Uh, we rank number two nationally in the sale of Christmas trees, and we've got a reputation for having the best Christmas trees in the nation. And I've got to brag a little bit again. We actually won number one and two uh, place at the national show. So the, our Christmas trees will go into the White House and to the Vice President's residence this year, and that, that's a big honor. Uh, we've been through a time uh, over the past several years that we've had an oversupply of Christmas trees in North Carolina, and that supply, I think, is beginning to come down, and we've been through the recession, and of course people are, you know, they're pinching pennies, but the, the real enemy that we have in the Christmas tree industry is artificial trees. Uh, so, you know, my job is to tell people, you know, why in the world would you buy something that doesn't even smell like Christmas? Uh, and it does take fossil fuels to manufacture these things. And my Christmas tree, when I get through with it, I take it down to the pond, throw it in the pond, and it's uh, a place for my fish bed. So it's got a lot of uh, useful things about it other than a Christmas tree. So, uh, you know, I'm, I am the Christmas tree inspector. Don't let me come to your house and let me find a plastic Christmas tree. This is a bad thing. <laughs> that that, that work is, is continually going on, uh, and I know that Phytophthora is, is a real problem with the Christmas trees, and, and quite frankly, uh, we have a lot of problems with Phytophthora in the nurseries after some of the flooding in the mountains. 
So it, it's a continual research that goes on uh, at our research stations, uh, particularly in Laurel Springs. That's where we do a lot of the, the Christmas tree work. Well, in, in actuality, we are doing food, we do food inspections now under a mem memorandum of understanding with the uh, FDA. And so we're in these, in a lot of these places anyway, not the, the produce places, but my recommendation to FDA is that in a pilot program at least, that they fund, uh, put the funding forward to do this because what we're doing, we're doing their work in, in actuality. We'll be out educating people to get them into compliance and I'm trying to tell them, you know, now what is your goal here? Is your goal to regulate and to find uh, and, you know, do it that way or is your goal compliance? And the goal should be compliance because when you've got compliance, you've got a safe food supply. So I'm hoping that there will be funding that will be coming from the, the federal government uh, for this pilot program to move it forward. And, you know, I need to say right now, FDA will never have the staff nor the funds if they do this alone. And part of the, the preaching that we did with the, the writing of this uh, new Food Safety Act was it had to be a partnership with the states and it'll never work if it doesn't work that way. Uh, they don't have the lab capacity. Uh, so we, you know, I, we've been very proactive in the department. We now have uh, an ISO 17025 accredited lab, which and we're only one of five states that has that. And we also do more, have more accredited uh, procedures in this lab than any other state in the nation. So we, we have positioned North Carolina to be at the forefront of food safety. Uh, and the reason being, it's a public health issue. We, you know, we don't want to see anybody get sick from eating food that's got a problem. But it's also an agricultural issue. Uh, when the cantaloupe recall occurred uh, last year and this year, uh, even though it was one producer uh, in both instances, they produce these cantaloupes. When the when the public hears there's bad cantaloupes, they don't they, the market drops. We had uh, several years ago, FDA said that uh, there were bad tomatoes, and and really there was no problem with tomatoes. It cost the tomato growers two hundred fifty million dollars. So one of the one of the other cornerstones of this program is if FDA uh, makes a boo boo. And, and they cost producers money, then there, there needs to be some type of indemnification. And that, that's also part of a study that's in this farm bill that, that we don't have. Uh, so, you know, all of this is it, going to take years to play out, and it's going to be inch by inch by inch by inch. But, you know, the goal would be that we have a safer food supply and that we don't have these massive recalls that damage agricultural markets. And also, as a part of this new uh, Food Security Act, it, there's going to be more inspection of foreign food that's coming in that's importing, uh, and there's also going to be inspection of foreign plants that are actually processing foods, that, and, and that's going to be another slow process. We're inspecting less than 2% of the food that's imported into the United States right now. So, you know, if we can, can inch that forward, that's going to be another move toward uh, a safer food supply. But, you know, even as we're having these discussions, I want everybody to remember we got 300 million people plus in this in this country. We eat three meals a day, and we eat it 365 uh, days a year. Uh, you do the math and see how many meals that we eat, and how safe the food supply actually is right now compared to other countries. But we can we can do better. There's no question. But uh, we do have a, a safe food supply right now. Uh, we, you know, one of the things that we that we're trying to do, especially with soil and water and forestry in the department, is marry some of these things so that we can. And with the with the energy grasses, there is a big project going on in North Carolina right now. Uh, and, and there's a company that's called Chemtex from Italy that wants to come in to Sampson County and put in a, a biofuels plant that would be fueled with these energy grasses. Uh, it's been a little controversial. In fact, probably when I get back, the NNO is going to have questions for me about this. But what we tried to do with this project through the Biofuels Center, you know, there's a big debate now over corn uh, and, eth and uh, being used for ethanol and, and food versus fuel. We saw an opportunity, if we could, could make it work, to use the spray hog spray fields in eastern North Carolina to grow these energy grasses. Uh, so you remove that debate over 
uh, food versus fuel. Uh, and right now we're growing uh, Bermuda grass on spray fields. And you know, it's a low, it, it actually is a low value crop. In a lot of cases, it's not even sold. So we moved that, tried to move that process forward. Uh, one of the one of the uh, energy grasses that uh, that we were proposing, well, that the company was proposing to use, is uh, Arendo Donax, which uh, is a base, it, it, it has been declared an invasive species by APHIS in some parts of the country, and it's not in North Carolina right now, and it act, it's actually used uh, it, as an ornamental uh, decoration in North Carolina in some places right now. So there's controversy over. Uh, whether we should be growing something that could be an invasive species in, in North Carolina. And fortunately or unfortunately, that falls to my uh, one of my divisions, uh, Plant Industries, and we're in that process of evaluation right now. Uh, USDA has come in with a program uh, through rural development that is actually assisting farmers in the establishment of these energy grasses. And the, the problem that I see with all of this is the, if we don't use spray fields, then we're back to food versus fuel. Uh, and these crops have got to compete with corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, in value per acre, and profit margin. And, I, and with prices right now, I, I know, almost know that can't happen. So that's kind of where we are. But North Carolina's future in biofuels is cellulosic, it's not corn. We would rank number four in the world right now uh, in the importation of corn and the, and the Midwest drought does affect our integrators as does the price of corn. So yes, we're working on it. Uh, it's still a little dicey right now, but I saw some technology in, in Iowa that's absolutely amazing. Uh, they have a combine, John Deere has developed a combine now that when you uh, harvest corn, it not only harvests the corn, but you can set the header at a height that you leave some of the uh, organic material on the ground but you harvest the corn uh, stover and the, and the cobs, and that is ground up and blown into a baler that is being pulled behind, uh, and then you have a huge bale of cellulosic material that, uh, that you can use. So you've added value to the corn crop in doing that. And that, that's some of the technology that, that I'm seeing out there that I, you know, that I see is going to be so, you know, so beneficial to, uh, to farmers. If you can add a, a value of another, uh, probably another 150 to Two hundred dollars an acre of corn just by harvesting stover, uh, you know that's a that's a big big jump. Well, I, I planted some uh, big blue stem this summer, and I, I wasn't using it for biofuel. I was wanting to use it for uh, feed for animals, mm -hmm. and the reason I did it was so that I could uh, reduce my reliance on fertilizer and also herbicides. And uh, so that's that's the angle I'm going from because I'm from Marital County and and I know several farmers that have grown it for that and also for wildlife to uh, increase the habitat uh, for the wildlife. But uh, we're trying to inc increase the amount of uh, acreage for the native grass in our county. And I'm just yeah. And I know they used to provide like I think it's two hundred dollars an acre to the farmer to convert their property over to that. Yeah, and, I, and that would have to come through uh, one or two places, either through uh, USDA or through the Agricultural Cost Share Program uh, through Soil and Water. And you know, that's another one of the budget areas that uh, that we've had problems with. The, uh, the Agricultural Cost Share Program has been reduced, 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 reduced every year. So, uh, you know, that's another you know that's another thing that we're going to have to look at is trying to get funding back in that. And that that's another one of those. Uh, the things that the legislature will tell you, we'll look at it again next year, and look at it again next year. But you know, the future is the future is the next minute, and and they, you know, sometimes they don't understand that. You ready to get rid of me? I won't put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we're out of time for questions. But uh, so much appreciate you coming today and being with us and, and sharing with us, and uh, and we do stand ready to continue to be a a good partner with you and the Department of Ag, and we really enjoy the work that we do together. So thank you so much so for being here.